Hi, and welcome to ChessOpenings.com. Today we're going to take a look at some very interesting ideas in the Sicilian, particularly an aggressive sideline for white that gives him opportunities to take black out of theory and set up an unclear position. Let's take a look. The Sicilian defense begins with the moves pawn to e4, pawn to c5. With this little pawn to c5 move, black is anticipating white's attempts to play for d2 to d4. Now black's idea here is very clever. He knows that in order for white to give his pieces full scope, he definitely will want to play d2 to d4 at some point. But at that moment, black is prepared to capture with a flank pawn as opposed to a central pawn. Now, why is that so important? Why is it so important that black is ready to capture with a flank pawn? Because black would then end up with two central pawns to white's one. This is really useful if eventually black decides to attack the center or simply restrain white's pieces from occupying central squares. We'll get a chance to see plenty of that in other videos where white plays his most popular ideas. But today, I want to take a look at a really interesting alternative to the main lines known as the C3 Sicilian, which begins, fittingly enough, with the move pawn to C3. Now with this little move, white is going to foil black's intentions of gaining a central majority. That's because by preparing d2 to d4 in this way, white guarantees that he will be able to recapture with a pawn after black captures on d4. That way he'll still have two center pawns. This is a very ambitious strategy by white, and it also has the advantage of avoiding a lot of theory. But let's see if we can identify any drawbacks to this move. Well, opening principles say that, in general, we should try to avoid making too many pawn moves in the opening. Instead, we should try to get our pieces out as quickly as possible. White's move C2 to C3 doesn't develop a piece, and just as importantly, it temporarily deprives the knight on b1 of its most natural square. In a way then, the move c3 is a little bit slow, and this allows black to play actively and to try to irritate white with some rapid play. So, one popular and rather strong response to the c3 Sicilian is for black to play pawn to d5. Now, notice that after the necessary moves, pawn takes pawn and queen takes pawn. Black is already taking advantage of the knight's inability to reach the c3 square and disturb the queen with a gain of time. So white often plays pawn to d4 here, and this leads to a really interesting strategic situation. White has achieved a space advantage, but has not really succeeded at gaining the sort of ideal pawn center he had hoped for. Instead, black can at any time give white a weak pawn on d4 by playing pawn takes pawn. Often black delays this for just a moment, but for learning purposes, let's see how this works right away. So I'm gonna show right now pawn takes pawn and pawn takes pawn. Now, what we have here is what's known as an isolated queen's pawn position. And I know that sounds fancy, but that's just a very complicated way of saying that the d4 pawn is isolated. There's no pawn to the right or left. There's no C pawn and there's no E pawn for white. And this means that he has no way of defending the D4 pawn with a pawn. This makes the pawn isolated and it also creates a weak square on D5. Black will try to use both of these factors. He'll try to prove that the D4 pawn is weak and he'll also use the D5 square as an outpost. So these are two little bonuses for black in this position. But before we count white out, we'd better realize that there are some really great things going on for white here, too. Notice that his pieces all have a ton of scope. Let me clean up the board for just a moment here. And let's take a look. Both of white's bishops have great scope here. White did just get the c3 square back for his knight, and he's going to get that square with a gain of time. There's also outpost for his pieces on c5. There's an outpost on e5, and he has open files on the c file and on the e file. So, as it turns out, the isolated queen's pawn situation gives white great attacking chances, but it also yields black great chances 
since he may consolidate his position and then prove that the d4 pawn is weak. So now backing up a little before pawn takes pawn, black normally delays capturing for a while on d4 because there's no hurry and there's no reason to give white the, the square on c3 for his knight until it's necessary to do so. So black normally continues by developing one of his knights. So in this case, we're going to take a look at the popular book line, knight of six, and white often continues his own development with knight of three, and one of the most common lines is bishop g4, bishop e2, pawn to e6, white castles onto the king side, and knight c6, and bishop e3. Now at this moment, white finally has a real threat to capture on c5. If white captures on c5, there's no way black's going to recover that pawn. So it's time for black to finally give white the weakness with pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, bishop e7, white gets this square for his knight with tempo, and now queen to d6. And if you take a look at this position, both sides have a lot of reasons to be happy. White has completed his development very naturally, and he's even gained a little time at the expense of Black's queen. He has some open files, and he has wide chances for active play here. However, the beautiful thing in chess is that unless we've made a serious mistake, we almost always have some serious trumps of our own, if only we can manage to neutralize our opponent's trumps. And so it is here. If I'm playing black, I know that if I play very carefully, white may fail to get much out of his slight advantage in space and development. Once that happens, I'll not only have an equal game, but I'll be much better. That's because the d4 pawn will prove to be a weakness as the game wears on. So the move pawn to d5 leads to interesting play for both sides. Both sides find comfortable squares for their pieces and the game becomes very interesting and complex, leading to an isolated queen's pawn situation. It's not clear who's better in this situation, and white's not exactly pushing black around. However, he does avoid a lot of theory, and he gets a very complex game for both sides. The other popular idea for black that I'd like to show you is quite a bit different, and it begins with the move knight to f6. With this move, black takes a different tack. He's still dead set on exploiting the unusual features of white's move c2 to c3. After the inevitable pawn to e5, knight to d5, the presence of black's knight in the center is actually a serious annoyance for white. Now, there's two reasons for this. Usually, the knight can't live here long, but the obvious move, uh, because of the obvious move c2 to c4. But here there are two major drawbacks to kicking this knight out. One is that white has already consumed a tempo, bringing the pawn to c3. Another is that there's a pawn on c5 here, which is making it pretty unattractive. Let's say that white does play c4. It's kind of unattractive here uh, that it's going to be difficult for white to play d4, so his pawns are kind of split up, and this c5 pawn does a beautiful job of keeping white structure uh, under check here. So for these reasons, White doesn't have such an easy time ejecting the knight on d5, and this is one way that he's taking advantage of this c2 to c3 move. Um, now, White has an advanced pawn on e5, and this gives him a definite space advantage. But if you've been watching some of these videos, you'll know by now that while it's critical to advance our pawns to cramp the opponent, win territory, and eventually threaten to make queens, pawn advances always come at a cost. One such cost is that the pawns themselves may turn out to be vulnerable to direct attack, and sometimes that proves to be the case here too. Black's going to try to break this pawn down with d7 to d6, and he's going to try to exchange this pawn off and leave white vulnerable and have wasted time as well. So still, white has space, and black's position is a little unstable, so white has some exciting options here too. Let's take a look at the typical moves. Pawn to d4, pawn takes pawn, and now since this pawn is currently pinned, white doesn't actually recapture just yet, he plays knight to f3, and now knight to c6. Now, white has two major ideas. 
White's got to be realistic and ask himself some tough questions here. He's got to say to himself, I can't successfully maintain the pawns in the center. Black is definitely going to succeed at exchanging my central pawns sooner or later using the break d7 to d6. So how can I aim for an advantage? Well, the answer, it turns out, is that White can aim to develop his pieces quickly and aggressively, taking advantage of the d5 knight's unsupported placement in the meantime. Over the years, White players in this position have come up with two major ways of going about this. One interesting way is to play the position as a gambit, sacrificing a pawn with the moves bishop c4, knight b6, bishop b3. So in this variation, in this book line, for a long time, white is going to allow black the option of taking on c3, but he reasons that this will give him even more scope for his pieces and a huge lead in development, plus he'll still have this cramping pawn on e5. In fact, Black rarely captures just yet, but instead he continues his development with the outstanding move, pawn to d5. And in order for white to get an advantage, he definitely has to remove this pawn because black's just getting too much share of the center if he's allowed to keep that pawn. So white captures using the en passant rule, pawn takes pawn, queen takes pawn, and now white castles. Again, giving black an option to capture on c3, but Again, black typically ignores this and continues his development with the outstanding move, bishop to e6. Black's getting closer and closer to developing his position meaningfully, but has still done nothing about the development of his king's height pieces, and he's not exactly castled either. So white normally still gets interesting play here using such moves as knight a3, which aims to bring this knight to one of these key squares. And now black finally does, in fact, capture on c3. And white avoids a trade of queens with the move queen to e2. And now black often plays bishop takes bishop. And this crazy aggressive move knight b5, which not only attacks the queen, but which is also trying to bring that knight into the c7 square. So black has to back the queen way up to b8 here and white recaptures the bishop. And this is a very interesting position. At the moment, black is ahead not one, but two pawns. But his pieces, they're making a very unfavorable impression here. The position is highly unclear, and this is just the sort of dynamic, interesting position white was hoping for when he played the c3 Sicilian. However, black, if he's prepared, shouldn't have to be too worried about this position. As aspiring players, we can help ourselves a lot by having positions like these in our repertoire and working at them persistently, sometimes with both sides, to improve our game. So I'm going to leave that position there, which is really interesting, and we're going to go back to this moment where I said that white had two options. So right after this move knight to c6, white has other ways to reach an imbalanced game without gambling upon. They begin with the book move pawn takes pawn, and now pawn to d6. Now, white threatens to reduce white's spatial advantage significantly. So to avoid giving black a dream position, white intends to defend his center using the clever pin bishop to b5. In this way, he reduces the attackers on e5 since the knight can't participate in the control of e5. However, if white were to play this move right away, he would get stung by an ugly move here. Can you see the tactic? It's queen to a5 check, which attacks both the king and the bishop. And this is a really unpleasant situation for white here. He would probably lose material with the move knight to c3. And now knight takes c3. And this is just a bad situation for poor white. He can probably minimize his losses with bishop takes knight, check, takes, and takes and takes, but he's just dropping material here and this position has no track record whatsoever. So white can't just go ahead and play this move bishop b5 yet. However, he has another little intermediate move which he can play first, which is very clever. First, he attacks on c4. And only after black's standard reaction knight b6 
does white now pin the knight on c6? And so, after pawn takes pawn, white now recaptures with the knight. And we've seen this isolated queen's pawn position before. White has scope for his pieces, and he's got a little annoying threat on c6 at the moment. So after the move bishop to d7, we have another unbalanced position. Clearly, black is threatening knight takes e5 right now, which would win a piece. So white has to make a capture here. One example of how he can go about this is, for example, knight takes bishop, queen takes knight, knight c3, e6, and castles. And the position is unclear. White has the standard pawn weakness on d4, but he does maintain a space advantage and he does have the bishop pair. So plenty of interesting chess going on here. Those are the positions I wanted to show today. We've accomplished a number of things. We've taken a look at a particularly aggressive system for white against the Sicilian, in which white aims to avoid allowing black one of his pet systems and one of his pet ideas of achieving a central pawn majority. With the move c3, we found that white does get some very unbalanced positions, sometimes around the isolated queen's pawn, or sometimes around gambiting a pawn. And in all of these cases, black is more or less okay, but the position is unclear, and whoever turns out to be more prepared has a great chance of winning. So there's a lot of great material here, and I recommend taking a look at these positions for both sides and seeing if maybe you want to try them out sometime. That's it for today, and I look forward to seeing you again.